By the time you get to the higher Middle Ages, so if we move beyond the Gaonic and we move into the high Middle Ages, which is more like the 11th, 12th centuries, we're starting to see a bifurcation based on the fact that we've now had quite a few centuries of this uh, struggle between the spiritual systems of Christianity and Islam that by the time you get to the 11th, 12th centuries, and particularly once you enter into the territory of the Crusades, and I'll remind us that the Crusades are happening on both sides of the Mediterranean, so they are happening over the land of Israel itself, but they're also happening in Spain in First and Second Reconquista. And it's a project that lasts for a couple of centuries. But it is, at the end of the day, a clash of spiritual civilizations, and the Jews are caught right in the middle of it we start to see the development of what I have termed the Yishmaelic and the Edomic models of the Messianic program. And rather than necessarily try and define exactly what those two terms imply, I'm going to illustrate them in historical figures as we skim through probably the most famous messiahs you'll need to have heard about if you're at a messianic-themed dinner party. The Messianic idea in Jewish history is something we've explored already for a couple of talks and uh, the interesting thing about tonight's talk, uh, which is the third in this series, and I am kind of working it through chronologically uh, for obvious reasons, uh, because if we're looking at the development of an idea, then we're looking at it as a, uh, a, a, a development and an evolution embedded in time. So, in line with that, uh, I have spoken in the past uh, quite a bit about the period I'm going to talk about tonight, which is going to take us pretty much from the end of the Talmudic period up to the Renaissance, which you could say is a period of around a thousand years. And I want to highlight at the beginning of this talk that Almost all of the material I'm going to cover tonight in, uh, in detail, or in any kind of narrative detail, I have discussed in other talks. So I'm not going to focus tonight too much on going into the minutiae of the narratives, which are amazing, because I believe that they can be found in, in uh, many of the other recordings of our talks that we, that we have given, and, and I probably will do it much better there in context than doing it in the context of this particular theme. But I will highlight the major historical outline of each figure I'm going to talk about. Well, what I'm interested in is the propulsion of the messianic idea by historical events, and then how, in turn, the messianic idea is the propeller of the next set of events. The messianic idea is a pulsating heart inside the story of the Jewish people. But that said, <laughs> we need to look at figures also as to how they represent in their own age the concept of the Messiah as it has been informed in the evolution of the Jewish people generally. And if you would recall, last week we came out of uh, the period of the second century with some tremendous destruction and disillusionment uh, regarding the uh, outcomes of the messianic idea because uh, the devastation brought by Bar Kokhba on the one hand and on the other hand the obvious uh, problem with a rising religion that was founded principally upon the Jewish messianic idea. So there is a sense when you get towards the, uh, through the later, especially the later Talmudic, oh, well, so the earlier Talmudic 
um, the later is starting to develop its own picture, but the earlier Talmudic, you're starting to get a sense that the that there is a danger that people are wanting to be warned about uh, in relation to the messianic idea. So already we're talking about an idea that has negative outcomes. And what we see is the... Now I'm going to... Huh, I'm going to use some texts again tonight, and I want to say that although this is not a text talk, uh, I treat the texts that I'm going to read to you as um, historic documents because they reflect the development of the idea through the stages that we're looking at. But we start to see emerging a picture of uh, what we might call, what I am terming and uh, what others may uh, have termed as well, a Midrashic Messiah. That is a Messiah that is built from the authority of rabbinic interpretation of Scripture. So we're starting to see that the statements of the sages, the statements of the rabbis about who and what the Messiah is, and given that the rabbis now have um, a, uh, a clarifying grip upon authority within Jewish spiritual tradition at this point in the late Talmudic. I mean, you're wandering around the world, you're either a Talmudic sage or a Maharetz as far as history is concerned because they're the ones that have left us their texts and their ideas about what Judaism looks like. And if they say this is what the Messiah kind of is, then that's where the authority resides. And I want to read two particular midrashim that illustrate this twin idea I'm talking about that starts really as a kernel with the authority of rabbinic statements on the one hand and the idea of the dangers of the Messiah on the other. Because if we are now in a state where it's not about leaving it up to our interpretations of the prophetic writings and the prophetic promises about who the Messiah is, not only are they sometimes ambiguous, but also they, as we have seen, have disastrous consequences. But if we're going to create a Midrashic Messiah, a Rabbinic Messiah, or a Messiah, not yet a Rabbinic Messiah, but a Messiah envisaged by the rabbis, if the Messiah is a construct, then so is the concept of the false Messiah. If anything, if the last couple of centuries have shown us anything, and I'm talking about if we were living in the 3rd and 4th centuries CE, uh, you know, the last 3 or 4 centuries, or the last, you know, if you're living in, the, say, the end of the 2nd, what the last 300 th years have shown us is that there is a concept of a false messiah. Now, these two midrashim, I'm going to read them quickly. Uh, one is from, uh, uh, taken from a Gemara, in Sanhedrin, it's also uh, in Yalkut Shimoni, it's in a number of different places, uh, and it's, uh, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be reading it in the context of this talk if it wasn't uh, an extraordinary text. Tanya, we learnt in a brighter, Rabbi Natan Omer, Mikra ze noke viyored ad the home. We have a pasuk, there is a pasuk that is unfathomable. And the Pasuk is an amazing Pasuk, because, and, I, and, and, and trust me when I say I could spend this entire talk just on these two Midrashim I'm going to read to you quickly, and I'm reading them historically as representations of a particular uh, view of the Messianic idea, but they are very, very deep. And the first verse that this particular Midrash brings is, Ki od chazon lemoed vefeach laketz v'lo yichazev ki im yitmameh hakeh lo ki vo yavo lo yaacher says Habakkuk, he says, wait, there's still one more vision, but you know, that vision's going to be for the end of times. And it will not fail. This is a true, true vision. And it's the end times. If it makes you wait, this particular vision or this particular prophecy of the end times, if it, uh, if it tarries, the famous language uh, used by later theologians talking about uh, the concept of the Messiah, imit mamea, hakelo, wait for him, or wait for it. 
Ki vo yavo, for sure it will surely come, lo yacher, it will not delay. That's a pasuk from Habakkuk, and Rabbi Natan is telling us that that text is unfathomable. Because lo kurabuteno shayu dorshin adidan itninu plag idan. Not like the rabbis who decided that the best way to understand the messianic end as a prophecy was to study the book of Daniel. Because Daniel's got this very, very mystical verse, which is a time, times, and a half a time. And that has sent people over the centuries to the nut house. I can tell you that. Um, every, uh, you throw a stone into uh, some levels of scholarship and people will have opinions on that. But um, this writer is telling us that, no, 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 don't worry about that. Whatever's happened there, that's not going to be your, uh, that's not going to be where it's at. Veloka Rabbi Simlai, and not like the expounding of Rabbi Simlai, Shaya Doresh, which he used to expound a famous verse. <laughs> very, very <coughs> mystical verse, which is from Sefer Tehillim. Chaltem <coughs> Lechem Dima, you fed them the bread of tears. Vatashkemo bidmaot shlish, and then you watered them with uh, with tears, with a lot of tears. And uh, there's a famous drush that says, uh, "Don't read uh, re- read the concept, the word shlish there, which is kind of like a wait, but read it really as as three. So they uh, the midrash is speculating upon three different types of redemption, three different. Phases of redemption, three different uh, particular advents of the messianic energy. The local Rabbi Akiva, not like Rabbi Akiva, Shea Doresh Odmaat, that famous pasuk from Chagai Odmaat, in a little while longer, uh, is it from uh, Chagai or from uh, Zechariah? But a little bit longer, and I'm going to, um, you know, shake up the heavens and the earth. So the Midrash then says, the first kingdom is 70 years, the second kingdom is 52 years, and the kingdom of Bar Koziva, remember Talmud calls him Bar Koziva, the deceiver, two and a half years. So then it says, what does it mean when the Pasuk says that this refers to the end of times? So Rabbi Shmuel Barachmeni says, Rabbi Yonatan, Tefach Atzman Shel Machash Vekitzin, that they should, you know, let's just uh, blast them away. Anyone that, that uh, they should be blown apart. <laughs> uh, anyone that is given to the calculations of end times. Because they used to say, that people would say, people would say, oh, well, that happened and the Messiah didn't come and now he's not coming anymore. And therefore, the verse says, if they say he's tarrying, still wait for him. Maybe you'll say, says the Gemara, maybe you'll say, we're waiting, uh, but he's not waiting. The Messiah is not waiting. Oh, Hashem's not waiting, I think is what it means. So maybe we're waiting for nothing, because we're waiting, but God's not waiting. This is an astounding question of the Gemara. God's not actually waiting for it. God, God has no expectation of a Messiah. Verse comes to teach you, then uh, it says, God will wait. God is waiting to be gracious to you. And okay, so since we're waiting, and God's waiting, what's stopping it? And the answer of the Gemara is, of the brighter is, what's stopping the arrival of the Messiah if we're waiting for it and God's waiting for it? Midat Adin, Kevin. It's the attribute of judgment is that which is preventing the Messiah from flowing, because basically what that would translate as, what does it mean, the attribute of judgment? That translates as, we haven't deserved it. And because we haven't deserved it, clearly there's far too much... Ju- um, the, the, the attribute of judgment, in other words, what, what, uh, what, what is keeping the world uh, from the fulfillment is the fact that there's not enough righteousness. I mean, that's one way of understanding it. Um, another way of understanding it would be that uh, judgmentality itself is too prevalent to allow the Messiah to come. 
Um, but that'll be a bit organic. Uh, okay, so then the Gemara says, well, since the attribute of judgment is st- is preventing it coming, Anu, Lama Machakin, Lama What are we waiting for? Well, then why are we waiting? If we're waiting, God's waiting, but the attribute of judgment is stopping it, why are we waiting? Answers the brighter, the Kabelscha. Shneemar, Asher Kol Chokevbo. Uh, to get a reward. This idea that the waiting for the Messiah has its own reward emerges in the Midrashic period as part of the classic construction of the Midrash. And the rabbi's picture of the Midrash as it emerges from the Talmud is someone who uh, restores all of the prophetic utterances as interpreted by the rabbis. They are, of course, uh, an enormous scholar, but they're also a warrior, and they're a ruler, and they're a righteous person, and they're complete fulfillment of the house of David, and it's basically utterly restorative. It is an embedded Messiah within the national historical religious framework. It is embedded in history... Nothing really changes, but it's restorative of the way things are supposed to be. It would basically take us back pretty much to the Solomonic era, but this time we'll get it right. Is basically how the rabbis would see it. Now, I want to just... I'm going to... uh, I'm actually going to read this second Midrash from from a translation of it that uh, in the uh, Sonsino translation, which I checked earlier, and it's quite a nice translation of this Midrash. Um, uh, well, meaning that it's nice, meaning it's, uh, <laughs> it's I, in my opinion, accurate. Um, and also nice, by the way. Nice. Now, check out this Midrash, because this Midrash, he very, very mysterious. Um... It is a, uh, it's wild to those who understand these things and even to those who don't, as myself. Why does it call it a night of watching? The Midrash Rabbah here is discussing Pesach. Yeah? Why does it call it a Lel Shimurim? What are we watching for? What are we, what are we waiting? Because Lishmor is also to wait and you know what are we what are we on what, what are we observing here? What are we watching for? Because on that night he performed great things for the righteous, just as he had wrought for Israel in Egypt. On that night, which is the first night of Pesach, the first night of Pesach, ladies and gentlemen, on that night he saved Hezekiah. Remember, we spoke about Hezekiah in lecture one. He is seriously one of our first proto-Messianic figures. That miraculous intervention of God in history that we spoke about then that propels the Messianic idea forward, that happened on the first night of Pesach, according to the Midrash. Hananiah and his companions, so the whole story with uh, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, that were in uh, the big uh, furry fire, fiery furnace. They were set. That happened also apparently on the first night of Pesach. Daniel from the lion's den, first night of Pesach. And on that night, the Messiah and Elijah will be made great. And in fact, uh, <laughs> um, the, the Sonsino has a beautiful note here that I want to share because... Uh, uh, because 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 I look uh, uh, looked at the midrash obviously and it says and it says uvo mashiach veeliyahu mitgadlin on that night mitgadlin which Sonsino correctly translates as they will be made great but there's a stunning note here at the bottom which they bring from Radal from Davil Lutzato I'm assuming is Radal which says that uh, you can amend that by just one letter. And perhaps that's what's supposed to be, is that without the Dalit, so it would be, Uvo Mashiach Eliyahu Mitgalin. 
which is just a beautiful, beautiful turn of phrase, but it means that is the day on which they will be revealed. But Midgadlin also gives us the same sense. The Messiah, when he comes, that will be on first day of Pesach, first night of Pesach. And of course, as a side note to that, that I'm sure you have already realized, is that the whole ceremony of bringing Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, into your house at the Seder is, of course, a manifestation of that redemptive idea that's right here in the Midrash. Elijah the prophet comes uh, on, and the most followed right then by the Messiah or whatever is uh, coming on first night Pesach. Because it says, and this is a pasuk, this is a verse from Isaiah, the watchman said, the morning cometh and also the night. Well, I have to make sure I'm aware of the time because we have quite a number of messiahs, but I want to deal with these midrashim. They're important that people are aware for the, for the purpose of setting up what I want to set up in the rest of the talk. But I'm nearly finished this midrash. It is like the case of a woman eagerly awaiting her husband who went abroad and said to her, let this be for a sign to you. And whenever you see this sign, know that I will soon come back. Okay. So Israel has eagerly awaited salvation since the rising of Edom. Edom, now um, we, once again, we've, in other talks we've gone into this. Edom is Rome. And Rome, I'm here to tell you, is Christianity. Meaning that Christianity is the spiritual discourse of Esav. Projected into history and into the world. And Esav, as I don't need to remind you, is a brother, not a cousin, a brother of Jacob. God said, let this sign be in your hands on the day when I wrought salvation for you and on that very night know that I will redeem you. But if it is not this night, then do not believe. If the Mashiach doesn't come on first night Pesach, if he basically comes on any other day of the year, he's false. But if he comes on first night Pesach, then you can believe it. And you know what's astonishing about that? Who came on first night Pesach? <laughs> <laughs> that actually belongs in last week's talk, but that's an irony that occurred to me. And, and, and precisely that's the figure that went on to become the spiritual discourse, or as some might have said, the tikkun of Esav. All right. Uh, the Midrash carries on in a beautiful way, but we, uh, we've done it for our purposes. I want to get back now. We've... Uh, uh, we discussed this. What, that, that, that second Midrash is astonishing because it establishes that there is a relationship between the Messianic idea and Edom, meaning Rome. Even if, even, without, even if we don't go in the direction of Christianity, which is clear, but uh, we come back and we just leave it as Rome as a hegemonic power in the world represented by some kind of spiritual force that's driving it, but at the end of the day must be overthrown and destroyed as the prophets have told us, then there is a connection between the task and the role of the Messiah and the identity of the Messiah in relation to Edom. And it is, it is not a coincidence that <laughs> deep in that Midrash is the idea of a kind of a reference to an overthrow of the spiritual system of Edom. And we've talked elsewhere about that. But the issue is, is that the centre of the Jewish world, and, and, and now we're going to pull back from that, we're going to look at history at this time, and this time I'm talking, you know, uh, by the time you come out of the Talmudic, so you're in the 5th and 6th centuries, or toward the end of the Talmudic and coming out of that, the centre of the Jewish world is not in the Roman Empire anymore. The center of the Jewish world is in the East. And therefore, <laughs> the East is not concerned with some kind of theological struggle. They are, in a way, more interested in a distinction that we made last week between the concept of Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah, the son of David, the Messiah, the son of Joseph. The Jews 
of the Persian Empire, well, I'm saying the Sassanid Empire, <coughs> during those centuries, before the Islamic conquest, when uh, Babel, Babylon, Babylonia is, uh, is in a world that is uh, so foreign to Judaism in, in many ways, uh, the, the Zoroastrian world, a pagan world, um, a world that uh, a world that made, you know, in some respects, um, uh, was uh, made Roman classic Greek and Roman paganology look simple by comparison in terms of the depths of some of the ideas that were going around, but politically there wasn't enough really to overthrow. Uh, and we saw, we, 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 I mean, there was no, there was, there was no focus on any kind of uh, theological issue, but there was still a possibility of a vision of seeing a world that dominated by the Sassanids and the Persians and so on, uh, as at the very least being, if not overthrown in itself, then being at least uh, a vehicle by which uh, the redemptive wars could be fought. And that is exactly what happened. Because the first Messiah I'm just going to link into, and that is, and that, and, and to in, in now, now that it's uh, basically eight o'clock, and I can just, I just now want to go through a material having set up certain uh, frameworks that I wanted to set up based in Midrashic sources and how the authority of the rabbinic and Midrashic vision guides historical events um, and which then in turn feed the idea itself. Uh, we s see the emergence of this uh, concept of the idea of the Messiah as the commander of a diaspora army. The redemption is now going to come from the exiles. And of course, think it through. Think it through. If you are commanding <coughs> an army from the exiles, then you're, and you're coming from the outside in, <coughs> then you've got to be Mashiach ben Yosef. Mashiach ben Yosef rises from the exiles because Moshiach ben Yosef is a descendant of the tribe of Ephraim and the ten tribes who were exiled. So their messianic quest of taking the land of Israel by force and establishing an independent Jewish state in the land of Israel from the outside, from the exile, from the diaspora, that is a Messiah son of Joseph idea. Uh, it's going to have repercussions for next week. And the first big exemplar we see of that idea is in the figure that I have spoken about elsewhere, and you know who I'm going to say. It is, of course, the figure of Nehemiah ben Hushiel. And Nehemiah ben Hushiel, who we assume is a historical figure, uh, certainly... Huh, Um, certainly had a profile within the early 7th century that was in accord with mainstream Jewry and the sages and the rabbinic and the thinkers of the time because Nehemiah ben Hushiel even gets incorporated as an identity into Midrash, into late Midrash. Nehemiah ben Hushiel, just for those of you who just want reminding of the historical context of who I'm talking about, uh, Nehemiah ben Hushiel is a figure who led uh, a quite a large Jewish militia on behalf of the Persian Empire in their wars with the Byzantines, which went over for quite a long time. We're talking, you know, uh, 30, 40 years. That's going back and forth. And, of course, the land of Israel was a central nexus of that. And in around 614, 
<laughs> yeah, I know. I know, I know. Get those dates. Those of you who are, you know, just generally aware of history would know that 614 is, uh, you're on the edge of the cliff right there. But uh, they uh, take the land of Israel. This militia, this Jewish militia, helps the Persian army to recapture lands from the Byzantine Empire in the course of which, uh, to cut a very long and complex story uh, short, they uh, do that in return for uh, being allowed to establish a Jewish state in the land of Israel. And the leader of that militia and the leader of that entire movement to establish uh, a Jewish homeland and to, you know, to build uh, up Eretz Israel as an independent Jewish entity in the beginning of the 7th century, the leader of that uh, was a person that we know as Nehemiah ben Chushiel. The project, those of you who are wondering what happened to that, did not last long. It was successful in the fact that they did conquer the Jerusalem and they conquered the land of Israel and they took it and they acquired it and the Persians gave it to them. But that state, which is often forgotten in history, sometimes by, by some people, that particular state uh, lasted round about the same amount of time that Bar Kokhba's did, around about three years before it all came crashing down. And the reasons behind that we have discussed elsewhere. But uh, once it, it, it ended up, it ended, the land of Israel ended up within the next couple of decades uh, in the hands of uh, Byzantium. And so it was, uh, uh, well, <laughs> that, that situation itself did not last that long, as you would be aware, uh, because uh, within a few decades of that, Faravum, uh, and uh, Faravum obviously means that uh, uh, Islam is going to sweep through and just overtake everything. And there'll be no more Persia and the Byzantine Empire will have to get out of the Middle East for a while. And there's a whole, uh, there's, uh, you know, th there's quite a number of historical events uh, that intervene. But what's interesting is that, uh, I mean, Nehemiah ben Hushiel was seen... Uh, clearly by his contemporaries as so much a manifestation of, of, of the classic uh, Mashiach ben Yosef idea that he is even incorporated into Midrashim. Not necessarily full-on, full-speed ahead mainstream Midrashim. You have to go poking around in places like Sefer Zerubavel and Pirkei Mashiach and other kind of obscure sources, but he is there. Um, but it, it, it raises an interesting question, because if he's Mashiach ben Yosef, well, the issue is, is that we still have this concept of the Resh Galuta. So the Resh Galuta is still the nominal descendant of the House of David. It's almost like saying, well, if you're going to fit with the classic rabbinic picture, which tells us that it's a rabbi, basically, that's a descendant of the House of David, who's also a great warrior and a great righteous leader, then... Well, that's not in Rome either. Um, these, this this uh, connection with Rome and the... Uh, but, but, the but, but how does the Rej Galuta fit in with this project in the diaspora? At the end of the day, we would have to either end the diaspora and he would have to do the restoration. When Islam came through, Islam, actually, early Islam, uh, recognized the position of the Resh Galuta, and the Resh Galuta's position continued really pretty much throughout the Garnic. And there has been considerable influence of the historical effect of Islam on the Messianic idea generally, if for no other reason than to counterbalance the projection of Rome through Edom, through Christianity, or Edom through Esav, Edom, Rome, Christianity, to counter that narrative with uh, a spiritual projection into history that was emerging from uh, Jacob's uncle, Yazek's brother by his father, Yishmael. If these figures are mentioned in the book of Genesis, then they are archetypes 
in the thinking of not only Jewish mystics, but even those driving the Midrashic project generally uh, within the Jewish people and within Jewish history. But even more so than the Persian Empire in general, Islam was not was not a hegemony that one could perceive overtaking to implement either a new idea about God or a new idea that would uh, help the peoples of the world in any more significant way. I have to think carefully about what I'm saying because I'm perhaps going a little bit off reservation. I want to come back and uh, because the the effect of Islam uh, on the Messianic because the Messianic idea really only bubbles away very quietly for quite a while in the first few centuries uh, after Islam. But I want to I want to move on because I want to uh, I, I raise it because I want to set up just um, briefly the model of the Messianic program that I developed in a talk that also is recorded elsewhere called uh, How to Convert the Pope, a Successful and uh, Failed Attempts to Bring the Messiah, in which, in which I outlined a distinction and a model that I want to talk to you about now. now. And when I say this, I just want to highlight that this, these are not official terms. This is not a model that I found somewhere and I'm delivering, because if it was, I would tell you where I found it. Uh, this is a model that I developed quite a number of years ago, but I've I'm yet to disprove it. Uh, it seems to work, and it gives us a nice, clear distinction um, within the messianic program that kind of may allow us some spiritual insight into it, and, and but more particularly for 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 these talks, uh, insights into uh, the ideology and history. Because where what you constantly see in Jewish history in terms of the evolution of ideas, you see bifurcation and synthesis, bifurcation and synthesis. And we came out of the Talmudic really with uh, the concept of the Messiah, son of Joseph, the Messiah, son of David. And we looked even last week at some Midrashim that, uh, that deal with this. But by the time you get to the higher Middle Ages, so if we move beyond the Gaonic and we move into the high Middle Ages, which is more like the 11th, 12th centuries, we're starting to see a bifurcation based on the fact that we've now had quite a few centuries of this uh, struggle between the spiritual systems of Christianity and Islam that by the time you get to the 11th, 12th centuries, and particularly once you enter into the territory of the Crusades, and I'll remind us that the Crusades are happening on both sides of the Mediterranean, so they are happening over the land of Israel itself, but they're also happening in Spain in First and Second Reconquista. And it's a project that lasts for a couple of centuries. But it is, at the end of the day, a clash of spiritual civilizations, and the Jews are caught right in the middle of it we start to see the development of what I have termed the Yishmaelic and the Edomic models of the Messianic program. And rather than necessarily try and define exactly what those two terms imply, I'm going to illustrate them in historical figures as we skim through probably the most famous messiahs you'll need to have heard about if you're at a messianic-themed dinner party. Because the Ishmaelic, which is a kind of a natural evolution, if you like, of the Mashiach ben Yosef idea, is that it is all about military conquest of the land of Israel. That has to happen. We have to do that as part of the messianic program. We have to, we, th th that doesn't happen for us, we have to do it. And so the Messiah is going to be a military commander, uh, but he's going to be, uh, over, because, and the reason behind that is because Islam has, for a long time, and in, in, in both hot and cold varieties, taken issue with the claim of the Jewish people 
uh, to the land of Israel. Our fight with Islam is a physical struggle over territory. Our fight with Christianity, on the other hand, Christianity couldn't care two hoods. Our fight with Christianity is over the Torah. It is, in fact, a spiritual struggle over... Yeah, it's a spiritual struggle over the, <laughs> uh, over the concept of God itself. And God's interaction and the identity with and the identity and nature of the Jewish people, it's, it's purely theological. And the first example I want to give us is an example of someone who I think, uh, as I'm sure you'd agree, is a classic example of a Yishmaelic Messiah. That, of course, and a famous individual, and once again, I have spoken about him elsewhere. Uh, but, of course, I'm talking, uh, we're going to uh, the 12th century, and we're going to Iraq, and, of course, I'm talking about David al-Roy, or al-Ruhi, as he was probably known, uh, and as uh, others much later in history called him, uh, David al-Roy. Uh, al-Roy's, uh, you know, the, the, the very, very, very brief historical uh, background to that is, of course, as I'm sure uh, you know, uh, well, first of all, he wasn't born David Alroy. He was born Menachem ben Shlomo. And there's always a Menachem somewhere in every Messianic picture. Uh, in all generations, you'll find a Menachem. It's a known Messianic name. But he decided that he needed a Messianic name on crack, so he changed it to David and he changed his surname from ben Shlomo to, he changed it to, uh, to um, Al-Ruhi, you know, of the spirit. And uh, da David al Ruhi had a uh, particular, um, uh, inter brought an interesting aspect to the concept of being the Messiah because uh, he was also, as luck would have it, a magician. So he was able to do magic tricks. He brought the whole idea, really, of the Messiah as. As, as, as miracle worker, as wonder maker. I mean, there's nothing really in the sources apart from being perhaps a conduit for God's power, but there's nothing in the sources that would seem to indicate, except in Midrashim, about uh, some false messiahs, that all they did was kind of ooga booga, hocus pocus. But now we're seeing the synthesis of that idea um, in the figure of the Messiah himself. The Messiah can disappear. The Messiah can do instant travel. The Messiah can do all sorts of uh, amazing tricks. And David Alroy did a lot of them. Uh, but uh, we all know that what happened, I mean, he actually managed to raise uh, a bit of, quite a bit of a militia from some of the surrounding towns. They had, they, they, they definitely started the project and uh, Alroy was very, seemed very much to be saying that, uh, you know, Anna Mashiach, and it was happening at a time of the kind of the uh, decline of the Abbasid dynasty and uh, of the Caliphate and the Seljuk Sultanate was also going through a bit of a difficult time. So there was a, like a vacuum and Alroy seized his chance, except that the problem with Alroy is that he, when he had his chance and every, all his militia turned up and all the Jews went out to wait for him to take them to Jerusalem to conquer it and usher in the messianic era, which is the culmination of that struggle, Alroy didn't turn up and was never seen again. He did the ultimate disappearing trick. The general suspicion is that the authorities uh, bribed uh, someone, a relative, to, uh, to do him in, but all sorts of speculation around that in Kurdistan. Who knows what was going on? But it's the quest for conquest. And, but there's an also another interesting aspect to Alroy's career that brings in yet another factor to the Messiah that is maybe, maybe, <laughs> it's not the genesis of the idea, but it's a kind of a spark of the what pops up. And some of you will be, uh, will, uh, you know, your eyebrows will get a little singed by this. But let me tell you that uh, for many years after Alroy's disappearance, there was a cult within Judaism known as the Menachemists who believed that Alroy was going to come back. 
We very, very rarely had a Messiah whose believers didn't believe at some point because they invested this Messiah with the fulfillment of their Messianic picture. Death was only ever going to be a temporary stage, a temporary state of the Messianic project. Of, of, sorry, of the Messiah's career. He's coming back, but we have not yet seen David al Roy. But now we have added doing wonders and the ability to come back from the dead as two more qualities of our picture of the Messiah. Now, interestingly enough, some of you will, some of the more astute amongst you will have noticed that, oh, 12th century. Well, we know who else is in the 12th century. And uh, why, he must have had some things to say about this. And of course, uh, we do. Because David al Roy is a contemporary of the figure that towers in Jewish thought over that whole entire period. And at that time, he's alive. He's the contemporary. And of course, I'm talking about the Rambam. I'm talking about Maimonides. And Maimonides uh, writes uh, about a number of different false messiahs because he has been sent letters from places like Teman. Uh, it's an open question as to whether he uh, specifically wrote about al Roi. We know about al Roi, by the way. We know a lot about al Roi because Benjamin of Tudela, the famous travelogue of the, of the century. He writes about David al Roy, but um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that the Rambam does, but uh, the Rambam definitely talks about the concept of false messiahs, uh, so he gets involved in that on a political level, but in order, really, to put the lid on it all, as far as the Rambam's concerned. And once again, a testament to the fact, as I mentioned, alluded to earlier, that really once we come out of the Talmudic, then our picture of the Messiah for Judaism is determined by the authoritative interpretation of Scripture by the rabbis. And Judaism can't really bypass that. But in order to stop everybody getting up and saying, well, I am in fact that manifestation, the Rambam wanted to make it very clear who could and could not apply for that position. And therefore we get in the Rambam, in his uh, famous Hilchot Melachim, The Laws of Kings, I believe it's chapter 12, he writes there that, uh, you know, he gives you the picture according to him of the classic Midrashic Rabbinic Messiah. And this guy is... Uh, Yep, well, he's the dude. He is a great scholar. He brings the Jewish people back to, you know, their, uh, their father in heaven. People, he brings people back to, to uh, what, uh, what some might call, you know, Yiddishkeit. He brings them back to, to proper true Torah values, the observance of mitzvah. They're keeping the Torah, basically. Then uh, he fights the wars of the Lord and he uh, conquers the land of Israel, of course, and he's actually able to effect a, a full overturn of the um, political system in the world such that nothing really changes fundamentally in nature, but uh, there's a new world order and Israel is at the center of it and, of course, the temple is, and therefore there's no war in the world, uh, because um, when Jews run things, there's never any fights. And, because, and he will build the temple, and that's the Messianic age. If he doesn't do any of that, says the Rambam, you know, let's say he's killed. And a lot of people go, ah, killed. Oh, maybe he's talking about Jesus. Well, maybe he's talking about Jesus. Maybe he's talking about David al Roy. But if he's killed... Or, you know, he just doesn't do what he's meant to do, and or he hasn't yet built the temple, and he hasn't yet done these things. And, of course, he has to be a descendant of the house of David, and that's a very, very important consideration for the Rambam. It ain't him. It ain't him. So the Rambam is really authenticating for the classic Midrash a halachic position. I mean, I've had people open a rumbum for me and stick their finger in it going, but it's halakha. Well, it's halakha according to the rumbum because the rumbum writes his picture in a halakhic textbook. 
So by now it's completely incorporated into the mainstream Jewish picture. This is what the Messiah should be. And that would probably tend to indicate, for those of you who, you know, run around going, oh, is, or those of us, rather, who go around running, oh, is the Messiah a person, or is it an age, or is it a man, or is it a woman? The Rambam tells you, and you can look it up, that's the effect of codifying the messianic idea in a halachic textbook. But that is going to have historical effect later on. And then, of course, the Messiah also, the messianic idea, then takes a sideways shift because if we're looking at the 12th and the 13th centuries, then we are seeing the rise not of rationalist classic rationalism, high medieval, middle, medieval rationalism synthesized with the rabbinic picture as you would have Maimonides give it to you. But with, of course, that period of time is the rise of the ideas, I mean, historically speaking, of the ideas that are beginning to shape what we now call Kabbalah that is going to culminate at the end of the 13th century in the revelation of the Tsar. And we now start to have people who are enunciating a mystical idea about the Messiah and those ideas in the 12th and 13th centuries are emanating very strongly from southern France and Spain. And that is where we will find, if you go to the middle of the 13th century, in the middle of the 1200s in Spain, you're going to find the Rambam. You're going to find Nachmanides. And in, who is deeply immersed in those spiritual and mystical circles that are uh, revealing to the Jewish people the doctrines of the Sfirot, the doctrines of the major... Um, ideas behind, that are going to be emerging in the Zohar by the end of that century. But in 1263, the Ramban takes, place, takes, takes part in the most famous kind of Christian-Jewish disputation of the Middle Ages, which is in Barcelona. And there the Ramban outlined a picture of the Messiah which seems to read from Midrash, certainly, uh, but it's really a part of an entire strategy by the Ramban to turn the tables on the messianic idea back into the Christian world in an attempt to convince the Christians, look, we may not necessarily have a problem with you, but leave us alone. <laughs> Whereas, you know, the Rambam, when the Rambam writes about it, his Rambam's picture is fundamentally Ishmaelic. Rambam wouldn't even care about Christianity. The Rambam would go, why would I even deal with that? I mean, it's 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 avodah zarah muchletet. I'm, I'm, I'm dealing, I've, I've got to deal on behalf of the Jewish people, you know, with Islam. I'm dealing with a serious religion over here. These guys are massive intellectuals. I wouldn't deal with, uh, with Christianity. Unlike the Ramban, who saw in Christianity something... Deeply mystical, deeply spiritual, but that was in great need of tikkun, of great need of correction. The Ramban tells whoever's listening in his disputation in Barcelona, which, by the way, he smashed it in three days against public Christianity. And we have spoken about that elsewhere. The Messiah is going to appear in Rome. <laughs> Naturally. But more than that, and uh, if you really, really want to see the full paid-up version of the Edomic model, look at the Ramban and what's going to follow that. Because the Ramban outlines to them that not only is the Messiah going to turn up in Rome, why is he turning up in Rome? Because the Pope is Pharaoh. Because the Pope 
is Pharaoh, and Moses is the Messiah. He is the first redeemer. He is the second redeemer. And he is going to go and ultimately the Pope is probably going to convert to Judaism and that's going to be the messianic moment. Well, the Ramban does not say that last sentence. I really should, I, those that I'm aware of. He doesn't, he certainly would not be, you know, uh, bold enough to suggest that uh, in Barcelona at the court of James I that the Pope will convert to Judaism. But the idea is, is that the Messiah turns up in Rome to have a theological struggle on a high level, metaphysical level, with the Pope. And it's, what's going to emerge from that is the messianic uh, moment. Just as Pharaoh, Moses himself encountered Pharaoh, and <laughs> those, that idea was deeply influential on one individual who's the next one I want to look at as an example of the Adamic model. And that, of course, is Avraham Abu Lafia. I'm going to go through this very quickly because I can see the time. And there are a couple of other issues I want to address. But um, I, I would say that Abu Lafia is the outstanding representative of the concept of spiritual messianism. Uh, we know his basic, uh, his basic, his basic outline. I mean, he. He is born in 1240. And we know that at 1260, he's like, at the age of 20, he's already excited enough about, you know, mystical things that he's going off in search of the river Sambatyon, that famous river that somewhere in the east that uh, on the other side of which, it can only be crossed on Shabbat, but on the other side of, it, of which are all the goodies, including the ten tribes of Israel who were just waiting for the redemptive moment. Uh, he goes in search of the river. He doesn't find it. But then in around 1270, he uh, comes across his big revelation. And the big revelation basically for Abu Lafia, and it comes pretty much at the same time that he starts learning Kabbalistic ideas. Uh, you know, so people talk about Kabbalistic ideas as being dangerous because you could go a little bit crazy or you might actually develop over time eventually some kind of messianic complex. But Abu Lafia basically... Uh, got the Messianic complex pretty much uh, by the time he got to the end of page one. Abu Lafia realized that his entire life really was a cosmic map of the Messianic project. He was born in 1240. 1240 is the year 5000. So, already. 1220, he's already looking for some Batyon. 1270, he's having these massive revelations. And part of the big revelation was the realization that, oh, I've got to go to Rome to convert the Pope. And we've spoken elsewhere about that phenomenal narrative of Abu Lafia's journey to Rome. It took like 10 years, but eventually in 1280, he turns up in Rome on air of Rosh Hashanah. And the outcome is well known because they were going to burn him the next day and turn him into a martyr. Well, they weren't turning him into a martyr. He would have been a martyr, but it didn't happen uh, because the Pope died overnight. And, of course, Abu Lafia's effect, uh, the effect of Abu Lafia on that was, was profound and, uh, and so on. But that's the basic narrative that comes across to us. Abu Lafia is more than just a, a spiritual messiah or a messiah, messiah of the spirit. He is the messiah of the intellect. He is, uh, he has been called by scholars the, the, the first Messiah Kabbalist because it is by his own mystical apprehension which in his own system is actually derived from Maimonides' philosophy about the active agent intellect. I mean, it is, it is a mystical apprehension that he wants to communicate to the Pope, <laughs> probably not the best Pope to choose to communicate it to it, even if he had uh, survived the night. But uh, it is the Messiah. The Messiah is now, in the Adamic model, uh, a mystic. 
Uh, he's not just a wonder worker. He is someone who brings a new apprehension. And that is consistent with what's going on in that period in the revelation of the Zohar, because by the end of the 13th century now, we have evidence that the Zohar has started to become known. And the picture of the Zohar that we have, the picture of the Messiah that we have in the Zohar is one that is still, at the end of the day, and I, I really, this is a... Uh, <laughs> This is a brilliant point actually made by uh, Yehuda Libus. Um, and when I started, I went, yeah, that's tr I think that's right. The uh, Messiah of the Zohar, is, the, the Messianic apprehension of the Zohar, is still embedded in the national, uh, the national historical religious framework. In other words, the act of restoration is a restoration of the vicissitudes that we and the dislocation of exile from that picture. It is still, in other words, it is still, in other words, a picture that emerges from the classic Midrashic rabbinic position. It's coming to f even mystically apprehended, and even if we're talking about the restoration of, at the end of the day, the symbolic mapping of the Sfirot, it is a restoration of, for example, Malchut with Tiferet at the level that they were as they were meant to be back in the first temple or back in the Solomonic era and so on. It's coming to fix the dislocation caused by the, ex the destructions and the exiles of the temple and all, those other, the, all the, the things that happened as a result of them. It's not yet a tikkun. It's not yet a correction on creation itself. That is going to come later. So just to point out that that's still the Messianic framework for the Zohar, but it's infinitely profound because it wants to introduce the Messianic age as the age of mystical comprehension, not just for Abu Lafia, but for everybody, where we start to see reality in a totally different way. We see reality itself as divine. That's, well, that might, actually, that, that perception might be a bit anachronistic, actually. I'll take that back. The Tsar is describing what the cosmic reality of the Messianic age looks like. And the construct at the center of it is the figure of the Rashbi, of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who represents that ideal construct as the Messiah. It's not to say that the Zohar was saying that the Rashbi was the Messiah, but what Rashbi represents uh, as a revealer of Torah, of a, the new Torah is actually a deeper level of the existing Torah. It is the Torah at the level of Sod that not only brings about a revelation, which not only brings about the Messiah, but is the Messianic revelation and whose existence confirms it. Redemption basically starts from the moment we started revealing these texts, says the Zohar. You know, if you're sitting there in Melbourne 700 years later reading it, you should know that the redemptive project started then. And if you don't believe us, look around you. Well, they wouldn't say that. If actually they came to North Caulfield and looked around them, I'm not... Well, yeah, they'd, they'd probably say this looks like Toledo. Now... But from which emerges, but from which emerges a new paradigm that really, and I'm just not going to go too deep into my own work here, but that actually emerges in just following or just par overlapping the generation of the Tsar, the f which is the, the generation of the Raya Mehemna and the Tikkunim texts, which are really bringing out the concept of what we would now call the Messianic Moses. It is the Messiah as the revealer of the new reality and the new Torah. It's not so much Joseph, or the son of Joseph and son of David. It's the Messiah of Moses. And it's not son of Moses. It's Moses. It pashtute b'choldara v'dara. That the redemptive spark of Moses' soul is not a spark, the soul of Moses is manifest 
in every generation. Every generation has a potential Messiah and a potential manifester of the concept and program of Moshe throughout history. However, and that, that itself, of course, <laughs> is a redemptive project which will bring about the Messianic era. And it doesn't hurt if your name is Moshe. So we have set, and of course, you know, some historians have alluded to the potentiality of, of cults within the entire Zoharic framework, which looked at uh, maybe a figure that they knew about or were aware of called Moshe. Um, some have speculated it was Moshe de Leon. Some have dismissed those ideas. But um, it, 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 the, the, the name Moshe as, as the Messianic Moses will actually go into a little bit more next week. But... Um, it, 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 it's, uh, it's an interesting emergence from the Zohar. It's not just about the name Moshe. It's about what Moshe represents. Moshe represents, Kabbalistically, the concept of Da'at. So it's the concept of consciousness. It is a shift in world consciousness about reality that Moses is going to come and deliver at the level of, uh, at the level of supernal secret. And that, of course, leads on to, you know, I mean, the 13th, 14th centuries, if we look, I mean, the course I gave recently that some of you uh, may, have, uh, may have looked at or heard, which was the, you know, the Kabbalistic journey through time. And one of the books we looked at was Sefer Atmunah. And Sefer Atmunah introduces this idea of the Shemitot. Yep. So we can see that the Messianic idea is being integrated into a Kabbalistic framework. And the Sefer Tmunah's idea that this, the current 7,000 has its own messianic millennium, but that's only just one part of a seven times seven cycle of the 7,000 years. Yeah? But what the, what, what the messianic age, says the Sefer Tmunah, the millennium that is the messianic age, the seventh millennium, is of any particular Shemitah, is that Shemitah's messianic fulfillment but it is also really the glimpse into the basic framework of the next. And of course, if we're in Gvura and Din, well, the next one is Tiferet, so our Messianic period is going to be very, very nice because it's going to be the window into the, the Shemitah of Harmony. What that will mean, says the Sefer Atmunah, it's fun, what we would call fundamentally a utopia. It describes it in great detail. It's, it's just everything is totally sweet. And not only that, but there are fundamental changes in nature itself. As alluded to by the prophets and discussed by the Talmud, by the Sefer Atmuna brings this out. It won't just be a utopia because of your social structures and everyone's nice to each other. It will be a utopia because it will be stunningly beautiful and everything will be plentiful and luscious and wonderful. As you wander around, completely spiritualized by this utopia. And, of course, for that utopia, you need a Torah of the next Shemitah. So you're going to get... And to, so the person that ushers that in, that's your Messiah. It is a shift in what the Messiah does. The Messiah is evolving into some cross between uh, a rational... Uh, not a rational, but... but, 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 but um, it, well, it's... It, it's it, emerging into basically a metaphysical task that the Messiah has to do, which is very different from leading a war. And I'm going to just spend the next few minutes before I finish up, because I, 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 if, if there's one thing, in each talk I wanted to communicate some kind of uh, a profound, vaguely profound idea, but I, I want to... Uh, uh, you know where I'm going. Because the culmination of all of this, the culmination, and in a way, the proof of my modelling here, uh, emerges as the end of the project, or at the end of the time span that I said at the beginning we would talk about, which is from the end of the Talmudic to the Renaissance. Because, and I have discussed this many times elsewhere, uh, Actually, before I talk about them, I, um, it would make more sense really just to introduce a couple more perspectives on the Messiah, just for one minute. The, uh, 
the, the things were good in Spain um, until they weren't. And people shouldn't underestimate the impact on Jewish history and thought and ideas and literature and just and communal life and just every single aspect that emerged as a result of the of the expulsion. And the expulsion itself really was kind of like just one phase of the Inquisition. The war against Judaism that was being and the Jews that was being carried on in Europe in the Middle Ages was relentless. Uh, and yet this idea was kept alive that those forces will be overthrown. And they'll be overthrown either metaphysically or they'll be overthrown militarily. We do have, during the Inquisition and the incredible pressure of the Inquisition, there emerged some lesser-known messiahs who are coming up through the Inquisition. Interestingly enough, a number of them are women, like the Maid of Herrera and so on, and people like this. And even in, even in, even in the, uh, even in the uh, converso communities and the, and the hidden Jewish communities of the Americas in the early days, even under the Inquisition, there were some messianic aspirants that we have spoken about elsewhere and don't want to go into too much uh, about it now. And you can see also, I just want to make this observation for people watching this uh, who might, uh, might realise uh, how clever this observation is, but I... I uh, so it's just recording this, really, um, for myself but and for those interested, but the because uh, it is really interesting, is that if we took, take someone who emerges from the, from the Inquisition and from the expulsion, uh, like Don Yitzhak of Barbanel, who basically spent the next few decades writing about the concept of the Messiah, writing about the concept of the exile, and, and, but, but presenting pretty much the classic uh, Hazalic uh, rabbinic picture, the Mid what we would call the Midrashic Messiah, which is the underlying theme of the Messiah in this talk, and he has a uh, he has a he has a he has an amazing uh, commentary on the book of Daniel, trying to interpret it according to Daniel's very revealed estimates and speculations about when the Messiah is coming. But that is at exactly the same time that the very first Kabbalistic book is printed, uh, which is extremely early. Uh, well, when I say extremely, it's not extremely early. It's early. It's uh, 15, around the 15, 14, 15, 15, which is a book uh, he called um, Shara Kitrin, which is, based on, which is also a, uh, an interpretation of the book of Daniel. So, messianic speculation hovers around the Inquisition and the expulsion, but uh, the real embodiment of its program you can see in the well, it gives rise to the concept of the Messiah as a penitent. Someone who is coming back. On the one hand, the Messiah as a martyr, but also the Messiah as a penitent. The Messiah who does Teshuvah. Because the concept of Teshuvah is going to come back into Jewish thinking about the Messiah. We can see that in Europe in the figure I'll probably mention again next week, which is Asher Lemline and the whole year 1500, which is the year known as the year of repentance in France and Germany, and there was this kind of penitence movement. But it's also brought back very much by the actual biography of the most amazing messianic figure of the 16th century, which, of course, is Shlomo Molcho and uh, Davida Ruveni, his uh, companion. And the, I have spoken extensively elsewhere about Molcho and Ruveni. Their story is nothing less than astonishing. But I want to just dive into the underlying theme here of what it represents uh, in terms of the movement of the Messianic idea. Because in Molcho and Ruveni, you see the combining and the bringing together of the Edomic, the classic Edomic and the classic Ishmaelic 
positions. Ruvaini himself says, I am the head. Well, my, you know, I'm, I'm a representative of the lost ten tribes. I'm living on the other side of the river that Abu Lafya couldn't find. I, my brother is the head of the army. Yep, we're, 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 we're the Reubenites, but it's all part of the one conglomerate. And let's, let's, let's have a war, guys. Let's, uh, let's bring these, these armies of the lost ten tribes of Israel. And let's join up with, uh, you know, the Jews, the tribe of Judah, who is still uh, hanging out in civilization, and let's go and reclaim the land of Israel, create that independent entity. At the same time, Molcho, what's Molcho doing? Molcho is busting to get to Rome. Molcho, by the way, who has come from the other end of the earth, conceptually as well as physically, who comes from a conversive background. The guy wasn't even circumcised when he met Ruveni. He circumcises himself, changes his name, and he and Ruveni start a movement of arousal and teshuva on repentance. They deeply, deeply influence Yosef Karo, who saw them in Adrianople in the late uh, 1520s. They... They were serious players on the world scene and they, the, they were messianic pretenders. I'm not going to accuse, say that Molcho and Ruveni at any point said of themselves, Anna Mashiach, but it was pretty clear because while Ruveni was arguing for that uh, military conquest, and in fact he wanted to do that military conquest with Edom, he wanted to do it with the Christian kings of Europe, his enemy was <laughs> the rulers of Islam at that stage basically the Ottoman Empire who were an unstoppable superpower at that time in history they had control of the land of Israel and they were Islamic while he was saying that Molcho was busy in the Vatican itself, having whispered conversations with Clement VII that, according to some rumours, led Clement himself to the verge of conversion to Judaism. So profound was Clement's uh, respect and feeling for Molcho, a guy who had abandoned Christianity and come all the way to Rome to deliver the message of redemption to the Pope. <laughs> so... For sure. This is the total bringing together of the Edomic and the Ishmaelic model. But unfortunately, apparently, apparently, it didn't work in their generation. Molcho ends up being a martyred messiah or a martyred messianic figure. And Ruveni ends up uh, not martyred, but uh, but uh, rendered ineffective in history. And yet, and yet, it has been said, if only by me, but it has been said that the episode of Molcho and Ruveni really is the spark of the spark of the grandparents of the redemptive project that, of 20th century Zionism that we will talk about next week because it is a huge shift. The messianic idea propels a historical reality going forward which is that the Jews are entitled to their homeland. They have a restorative project that is built into their spiritual DNA to go back to the land of Israel as part of their redemptive project. So however you want to make it metaphysical, however you want to deal with the Messiah on the level of ideas, there is a gritty historical reality to what will have to happen for the Messiah to come. And the famous words of the prophet Isaiah, Bi'itah Hishena, in its time I will hasten it, it's a little bit like saying, do you want to do this the easy way or do you want to do it the hard way? The easy way is, <laughs> is that we, the Jewish people themselves, the people of Israel, 
do repentance and return to righteousness and righteous living, then the attribute of judgment is suspended and the Messiah comes. This would have been the picture that would have been signed off by anybody and still is. But then, if it's going to require a military action, it's going to require military action. It'll be very one-sided, but if it's required, it'll happen. But ultimately, we just want everyone to get along. It would actually be easier. If you remember that we spoke about the two worlds last week of the now and the future, it's going to be a lot easier if people have the mystical apprehension as God comes into the world as an intellectual idea as well as a physical reality and people's minds will start to bathe in the radiance of that vision of God's world, which means it's still informed by the Zohar, it's informed by Jewish thinking very, very much, the idea of the change of perception. They both have to happen hand in hand. Yishmelech and the Adomic come together. Thank you for your attention. I want to thank Kofil Shul again, and uh, I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible for this next uh, adventure as we move forward in the messianic idea because the messianic idea is going to propel some very big events that are going to land right on our doorstep.